Before we uh, introduce our esteemed speaker for today, I would like to extend our sincerest and heartfelt thanks to Trustee Emeritus Murray Pepper and to Vicki Reynolds Pepper, who both established the Distinguished Visiting Artists and Scholar Lecture Series in 2007. Their generosity has allowed us to bring extraordinary artists, poets, filmmakers, writers, theorists, and thinkers to Pitsy College, which we would not have been able to do so without their invaluable support. While I would love the honor of introducing our distinguished guests for today, it is more appropriate that I pass this privilege on to Annie Buckley, who has worked directly with Father Gregory Boyle and has known him since she was a child, and to Stan Hunter, who has been deeply influenced by his work. Before they introduce Father Boyle, I would like to say a few words about Annie and Stan. Annie Buck Buckley is the curator of our current exhibition, Disruption, Art, and the Prison Indu Industrial Complex. It's up for a few more days, so if you haven't already seen it, please uh, take some time to visit the Nichols Gallery. Annie is a multidisciplinary artist, writer, and curator with an emphasis on art and social justice. And since 20, uh, July 2019, is the director of the School of Art and Design at San Diego State University. She has written extensively about art for leading publications, including Art Forum, Art in America, The Huffington Post, and KCET Artbound, and is also a contributing editor to the Los Angeles Review of Books, for which she writes the series Art Inside, about facilitating art programs in prisons. Annie is the founder of the Prison Arts Collective, a statewide program dedicated to expanding access to the transformative power of the arts through collaboration and mutual learning. Stan Hunter is a practicing artist who taught himself to paint while incarcerated for over 30 years. Finding deep healing through art, he dedicated himself to sharing it with others and has supported numerous peers to find joy and meaning through art. He finds purpose in sharing his skills and artistic techniques with those who may be struggling to find their own purpose. Hunter is a founding member and lead teaching artist with the Prison Arts Collective. So um, Annie and Stan will now introduce our guest speaker, but please give uh, Annie and Stan a round of applause. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you, Kira, and everyone at Pitzer College for inviting this exhibition and this incredible event. And thank you so much, Father Greg Boyle, for being here with us today. I know you're all really eager to hear him, so we're going to make this short. But we wanted to share a little, um, some stories that will hopefully help to introduce him in a, in a personal way. Um, so I'm honored and thrilled that the final event in this exhibition, Disruption, is this talk by Father Boyle. We've had four events here in the gallery and also inside the prisons alongside the exhibition. So all of our programming took place in both locations. And the exhibition includes artists who are in the community or advocates and allies who are also well-known artists throughout the country as well as currently and formerly incarcerated artists side by side in one exhibition. So I hope you see it if you haven't yet. Um, so today we're going to hear our talk by Father Greg Boyle. He needs a little inspiration. He is an uh, inspiration, little introduction, but he's an inter inspiration to so many people and a dear friend of our family and my late mother. He is the founder of the world-renowned gang intervention and prevention program Homeboy Industries. He is a Jesuit priest, internationally lauded advocate and leader and best-selling author and whose radical kinship inspires all of us. I'm sure that's why you're here today. I met him when I was a kid, but it wasn't until my first year of college when I had a job as a bilingual teacher in the Pico Union area of LA and I went over to East LA to meet with you and I wanted to help, but I'm this kid just out of college, you know, how can I help? And he says, do you have any jobs? I'm like, I barely got a job myself. So I really wasn't in a position to help with what was needed at that time. 
Um, but I've been watching the work and inspired by it, like many of you over the years. And I'm so happy to now have had a life in the arts that has also allowed me the opportunity to create jobs and opportunities for others. So to speak more directly to Father Greg's impact, I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Stan Hunter, who is both an artist and a former, former army sergeant who also spent 30 years in prison. And that's where we met. And I first saw his artwork, and we've collaborated to evolve the Prison Arts Collective. Hello, everybody. I first became aware of this visionary back in 1970, 1997 and 1998 through a friend of mine. And even though the information was secondhand, for the first time in 10 years, I seen and felt a glimpse of hope like never before. I was still stuck in rock bottom, desperately searching for a way out. This man started a movement of change on every level and accomplished what seemed impossible for many people. The system labeled us the worst of the worst with no redeeming value and threw their hands up in frustration. This man rolled up his sleeves and walked into the most violent, one of the most violent places in the US and helped people like me realize our true potential as human beings. A person's heart is only eight inches away from our brain and it's said that for some it's the furthest distance to travel. <laughs> Father Greg Boyle found the expressway straight to our hearts and gave us compassion, love, and forgiveness. He gave us our lives back. He gave our lives back to us and reminded us that we were capable of accomplishing anything. He believed in us, so I want to tell you it's an honor and a privilege to introduce Father Greg Boyle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kara. Thank you, Pitzer. Thank you, Stan and Annie. That was very uh, beautiful. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, know you guys. And uh, I, I recommend it. That the exhibit ends on uh, the 6th on Friday. So I recommend that you go there. It's a wonderful uh, exhibit. And Stan's art is uh, just sort of jaw dropping. So I recommend that you uh, do that. Um, it's a privilege uh, to be here and a privilege of my life to. Uh, have worked for 35 years with gang members, and they've, you know, helped me see things. I wore the sweater the other day, and one of the homies said, gee, Mr. Rogers just called. <laughs> and he'd like his sweater back. Um, and so for 35 years, yet, knowing gang members has really uh, shaped my heart and altered the way I see things, and the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I am closer to God than those thousands of men and women and, uh, and Stan. Um, people like Louis Pettis, who is kind of, was a force of nature and he was a kind of a, worked there for like 10 years and helped run the place at one time in our 31 year history as an organization. And, uh, he, you know, had been to prison, a uh, shot caller from his gang, a heroin addict, but in recovery. And he liked uh, speaking, giving talks, and he was quite good at it. And uh, in fact, he was kind of in demand by name. High schools would say, can you send Luis Perez? And uh, once he and I, we went out to dinner and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. <laughs> and he said, you know... You gotta pepper your talk with self defecating humor. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, no shit. That's uh, that is some good, good advice there. Uh, 
you know, you mentioned I'm a Jesuit priest, just like uh, the Pope is. I just met him like uh, three weeks ago, and uh, we were at a big Jesuit conference, and it was kind of surreal. Uh, but the homies don't really know what a Jesuit is. You know, I have to be honest with you. And and I, you know, I have my office, which is has glass enclosed, and and I can see out into the floor. Some of you uh, have been there, and. Uh, and so we have like six tour groups uh, a day from all over the world. And some of you have been on tours there. And the homies run the tours. And I remember there was a, a, a tour just kind of parked right in front of my office. And I'm talking to a homie. And it's one of those observe our founder in his natural habitat. <laughs> and uh, the tour guide is Gilbert. And Gilbert has, as the homies say, a loud ass voice. you know. And he's standing there. He says, this is Father Greg Boyle. He is the founder of Homeboy Industries. He is a jujitsu priest. <laughs> so I kind of, I give my best moves, you know. So here's why I think you're here uh, tonight, is this afternoon, uh, is because I think you want to imagine something uh, different. You want to imagine the world especially now, looking differently than it currently looks. And uh, Mother Teresa was quite right when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we create a community of kinship such that God might recognize it? It's God's dream come true that we be one. How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? How do we go from this uh, talk this evening to really choose to find ways to dismantle the barriers that exclude? And so I, I think uh, we all know that the only way to really do that is to go out to the margins. And and because if you stand at the margins, look under your feet, uh, they're getting erased because enough people chose to locate themselves out there. And you stand with a particularity, with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. Uh, you stand with those whose dignity has been denied. And you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, you just get this exquisite privilege to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out you get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And you stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And I suspect if kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice, we'd be celebrating it. For no kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice, no kinship, no equality. No matter how singularly focused we may well be on those worthy goals, I think the truth of the matter is they can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we belong to each other. And so we inch our way out to the margins and, and we brace ourselves because people will accuse us of wasting our time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And you go to the margins and other voices get heard. At Homeboy, you know, and I know this had to have been uh, Stan's experience, the homies are, are used to being watched but they're not used to being seen. And there's a, obviously a huge difference in that. Um, you know, the Buddhists have a, a, a line that they say often, uh, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And uh, it's about being seen, which is kind of uh, what you want to affect and how you go to the margins is how you are at the margins. You don't go to the margins to make a difference because then it's about you. But you go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. 
and then it's about us. Uh, I remember I was giving a talk in Houston, and afterwards a guy came up to me, what we would call in the biz, a hardcore gang intervention worker. So he works in the streets, you know, former gang member, been to prison, tattooed, really good guy. I've come to know him over the years, but that was the first time I met him, and he kind of very earnestly asked me after the talk, how do you reach them, meaning gang members? And I said, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Can you see who they are? Can you allow your heart to be altered? Can you receive their truth and delight in who they are? Um, this, this feels like a, a digression, but I don't know why, I, you know, uh, Annie's uh, mom, Alice, who I love so much, and uh, I buried my mom just uh, uh, not that long ago, and, and uh, she was uh, 92 years old, and, uh, you know, she died the way people would want to, in their own home, in their own bed, surrounded by their kids. She had eight kids, and my, I buried my father like 25 years ago. And uh, she was sharp till the day she died. I mean, in the last year of her life, she watched so much MSNBC. <laughs> she was becoming Rachel Maddow. And she wasn't a lick afraid of dying. You know, she, uh, I remember once a, couple, a month or so before she actually died, she said with kind of great exhilaration, I've never done this before. <laughs> you know, which is like something you might say just before skydiving, you know, and in fact, her last words to me were the day before she died, and I just happened to be there by myself, which never happened, sitting at her bedside, and she was asleep, and she woke up, and she saw me, and she said, oh, for crying out loud, and she went back to sleep. Well, she was pissed off that she hadn't died yet, you know, and so I'm going, sorry, but then the next day at noon, again, this just absolutely never happened. I was there by myself because there were so many people, so many of my sibs always around. And, and there I was again, exactly at noon. And she kind of sat up and her eyes opened and she let out this wondrous, glorious gasp. And she left us at skydiving. And nobody in earshot of that sound could ever be afraid of dying again or of death. But uh, in the last weeks of her life, you know, when we'd have two or three or four or all eight of us standing around her bed, she'd be in and out of consciousness. And, but every time she woke, she would lock onto one of us and she would just have this laser beam focus and, and she would say with breathless delight, you're here, you're here. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yeah, it's a song about Jesus. And yeah, it's a song about Christmas. But how is it not the job description of every person in this theater? You appear and the soul feels its worth because you allowed yourself to be reached. Oh, nobly born. Remember who you really are. It's, it's because... You stop watching people and you decide to see people and, and your whole being says, you're here, you're here. And so you want to kind of bridge that gap that sometimes exists even in our service, you know, otherwise it's service provider, service recipient. And you want to make sure there is no daylight that separates you from people. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend, and, and uh, he was uh, the best listener I've ever been in the presence of. If you talk to him, nobody else existed. He was laser beam focused. He was never looking over your, your shoulder to see if the mayor was walking over. His whole being said, you're here, you're here. But famously, a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Sessa just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which is the hope. How do we enter into this exquisite mutuality where there is no us and them, 
where there is no service provider and service recipient. Service is where you begin and which is perfectly fine. But don't end there because service is the hallway that gets you to the ballroom. That's the whole point, the place of exquisite mutuality and connection. That's where we want to arrive. At Homeboy, we always we kind of say that, you know, the senior staff there, we're, we line the hallway so that people will get to the place of connection and kinship and exquisite mutuality. But there was a homie and, uh, named Dreamer, and nobody in our 31-year history, you know, ever had more job opportunities than this guy. Um, he was a kid from the projects from my parish, and his older brothers were from a gang, and he got into the gang. And, and one of the smartest homies I've ever met, you know, with a dangerous sense of humor, and he's doing fine now. He, he lives uh, uh, out this way somewhere, and he's a construction job and married a house and three kids. But in his early 20s, he really was quite the uh, yo-yo. You know, he was in and out of being locked up, and I'd find him a job in the private sector or maybe in one of our nine social enterprises. And always he'd kind of gravitate back to vague criminality, you know, something usually involving drugs, you know, the sale of or the use of, and then he'd wander back to me. So it was a very repetitious, frustrating pattern. So this one time he finished like a four-month uh, probation violation stretch at county jail, and there he was sitting in front of my desk, and, and he says what, you know, gang members often say, this time it'll be different, you know, and I said, well, all right, so with him sitting there, I picked up the phone. I called a friend of mine named Gary, who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California, and he uh, had hired a lot of homies in the past, so I'm hoping against hope maybe he'll do it again. And sure enough, he says, you tell that guy he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work the very next day. Uh, at the vending machine company. Well, two weeks later, there he is again in my office. I couldn't believe my eyeballs. I said, Híjole Madre Santa, here we go all over again. But this time he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out his very first paycheck and he waves it proudly. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well. <laughs> who? <laughs> and he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. <laughs> oh, sure, no. That's right. That, that would be God. <laughs> he said, wait a minute. You thought I was going to say you? I said, no, gosh. God's number one. <laughs> he said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, the only thing I really remember was the two of us, we fell out of our chairs and we just howled with, with laughter. And I defy you to identify exactly who's the, serv the service uh, provider and really who is the service recipient. I have no idea. It's mutual. So Homeboy was started a long time ago uh, when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I started as a pastor in 1986, Dolores Mission Church, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. At the time, it comprised the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. And we had eight gangs at war with each other in these two housing projects, which was unheard of for public housing. The LAPD said my parish was the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in all of Los Angeles. So if LA was the gang capital of the world, my parish was the gang capital of Los Angeles. I didn't know that when I drove up, you know. There are 120,000 gang members in L.A. County and 1,100 gangs. 
I buried my first uh, young person killed because of the sadness in 1988. And I buried my 231st uh, three weeks ago before I went to see the Pope I, I, the day before. Uh, not all from that community, but uh, I run a large gang intervention program. I get asked to do that. Uh, so the uh, first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Um, and they were wreaking havoc in the middle of the day. They were writing on the walls. They were selling drugs. They were violent. So I walked out to them, and I would kind of isolate them. And I'd say, hey, uh, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, they all said, yeah, you know, I would. And then I, I couldn't, uh, you know, find a school that would take them. So it, <laughs> it kind of forced my hand. So across the street from the church was our, our parochial school, grades K to 8, occupying the first two floors. And uh, the entire third floor was the convent. So one night I gathered all the nuns together in the living room and I sat them down and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out? And, uh, and we could turn the convent into a school for gang members. And they, I remember they looked at each other and they went, sure. And that was the entirety of their discernment process. And then uh, gang members came in large numbers to this school situated in the former convent on the third floor. And parishioners would sidle up to me, you know, and they'd say, hey, you know, aren't churches supposed to be, be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. And, and I thought that was, you know, a good gospel challenge. And then the gang member said, if only we had jobs, you know, so... Myself and the women in the parish, and it was mainly only women who were in the projects, women with children, we marched around the, the housing projects uh, to, uh, to, to the factories that surrounded it, trying to find felony-friendly employers, and that wasn't so forthcoming. So we, uh, we started things. We invented things like a maintenance crew and a landscaping crew and a crew to build our child care center, all made up of members of the rival uh, eight gangs. Then in 1992, some of you may recall, uh, after the Rodney King verdict, the whole city, every pocket of poverty in Los Angeles ignited, except the poorest pocket, my parish didn't, which led the LA Times wanting to know why, and so they asked me, and I said, well, you know, maybe it had to do with the fact that um, we had uh, 60 strategically hired rival enemy gang members who um, had a reason to get up in the morning and work side by side with their rivals. And they had a reason not to gangbang the night before. And more to the point of your question, they had a reason not to torch their own community. So the article appeared the next day and the following day, I was summoned uh, to the Beverly Hills office of a movie producer named Ray Stark, who happened to have $500 million. And he asked me, how should I use my money? And as I look back on it, I see that I woefully undershot my request. <laughs> I was young. I had hair. I, I don't know. <laughs> So um, I said, well, there's a, a, a bakery, abandoned bakery across the street from the school. It's got ovens. You could buy the place. The ovens don't work, but you could fix them. I don't know. We could put hair nets on rival enemy gang members. And I suppose, you know, they could bake bread and we could call the whole thing homeboy bakery. I mean, literally, this was the extent of my business plan. And and he said, sure. So then we were off and running again. And a, a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we changed our name from Jobs for Our Future, which is what we called ourselves, to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this. And 
not everything worked. You know, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy plumbing really was not hugely successful. Who knew? Uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I, I, I did not see that coming. And nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we backed our way. We evolved our way into now becoming the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on our planet. So 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors wanting to reimagine their lives, wanting to be seen. Every homie comes in with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. Mom was frightening or frightened. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. So the first stop and the first step in transformation really is a safe place, a place of rest where they can dislodge the backpack filled with chronic toxic stress. And then they gain resilience and then they, in our 18 month training program, if they surrender, uh, surrender to the healing, then they can re-identify who they are in the world. And then they leave us after 18 months and the world, of course, will throw at them what it will, but this time they won't be toppled by it. Uh, so we, everybody's in therapy. We have four paid therapists, but 49 volunteer therapists, including three psychiatrists. We have a lot of classes, everything, like 60 of them, like anger management and parenting and stuff. Tattoo removal, no place on the planet removes more tattoos. Um, you know, we have a designated clinic with three laser machines, one paid physician assistant, 43 volunteer doctors. So if anybody's starting to regret that Pitzer tattoo you have, uh, <laughs> see me afterwards. And it was started because of a guy named Frank. We give total credit to Frank, and Frank was, nobody knew him, and I never met him, and he, two days out of Corcoran State Prison, and he's sitting in my in front of my desk and, and tattooed on his forehead, filling the entire space like a big old black uh, um, billboard with black block letters, and pardon my French, it said, fuck the world. And he said, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> And I said, well, Frank, uh, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. <laughs> so naturally, I hired him, and, I, and he bagged bread. And, uh, um, and I went trying to find a doctor, you know, and, and I found one, Dr. Venor at White Memorial Hospital, who had a laser machine. And he donated one hour a month to chip away on Frank's forehead and a handful of others. Well... Before too long, I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted the same treatment, so we couldn't stay with that arrangement. And uh, parentheses, you know, Frank is currently a security guard at a movie studio in Hollywood, and there is no trace left of the angriest, dumbest thing he'd ever done, proving once and for all that everyone here in this room and outside of it is a whole lot more than the worst things they've ever done. And then we have all our training programs, our uh, solar panel installation training, Homeboy, uh, all our businesses, Homeboy Silkscreen, been around for like 27 years. Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff. Homeboy Diner, the only place you can get food at City Hall. We have a restaurant at Terminal 4, American Airlines Terminal. We have a thing called Homeboy Grocery where we sell chips, salsa, and uh, guacamole in supermarkets on both coasts. Um, we have uh, farmer's markets. We have uh, Homeboy Recycling, which is uh, electronic waste. That's really kind of a growing business. And Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. And they cater. 
it's a who's who if you ever go there uh, we, we just do breakfast and lunch and into the early afternoon and you're bound to run into a movie star or a, a elected official jim carrey's been there a few times and jack black and forrest whitaker and we appreciate their uh, you know visiting us and uh, once with only two hours notice we had a visit from uh, two hours notice from the secret service a visit from Vice President Joe Biden when he was Vice President. So it was entourage and motorcade and uh, selfies with Uncle Joe. He just wanted to eat at Homegirl Cafe. God love him. And uh, most famously, it was Diane Keaton who showed up once uh, for lunch. Oscar winner, movie star, uh, Godfather movies, Annie Hall. Her waitress is Glinda, and Glinda's a big girl, been there, done that, tattooed, felon, uh, parolee. She has no idea who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glinda rattles off the three dishes she really likes, and, and then uh, uh, Diane Keaton says, well, I'll have that second one. That one sounds really good, and and for some reason, at that moment, something dawns on Glinda. She looks at Diane Keaton. She says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere, you know, like maybe we've met. And Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And, and then Glinda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> Yeah, that just took my breath away when I heard it, and I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. But suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, that you may be one. How do we obliterate the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us in them? Everyone in this auditorium is uh, invited to become an enlightened witness, a person who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. Honest to God, at home, we were really just allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking gang members to measure up. Instead, we hold the mirror up and we tell people the truth, oh, nobly born, Remember who you really are. You're here. And the soul feels its worth. But we know that before you get to that moment, you have to kind of reach in and you have to dismantle the barriers that exclude. You have to dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way that keep people from seeing their truth. For the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. There's a line in the Acts of the Apostles that kind of leaps out, and, and it says simply, and awe came upon everyone. And it seems to suggest that the health of any uh, community, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So uh, I remember a number of years ago, I was invited to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, it was one of those uh, gang in-services, so if there are any social workers here, you know what I'm talking about. They, it's nine to five, they commandeer a hotel ballroom, uh, workshops, uh, breakout sessions, keynotes, uh, and you get credits for it, you know, and so, uh, you know, I was invited to go, and I figured, well, I said yes, I figured I'll do a keynote, because that, that's what I'd done in the past at these things, so I bought my ticket. Well, a week before I was to fly, I pull out the letter uh, explaining this day, and to my horror, I discover that I am to be the only speaker nine to five all damn day. 
And I said to myself, as the homies say, oh, hell no. So I call in two uh, trainees, uh, Andre and uh, Jose, and I sit them down. And they're in our 18-month training program, you know, where they get paid. And, and they were like kind of in their ninth month or something, midpoint. And I sit them down and I said, look, at the end of the week, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up in front of 600 social workers and tell your stories. Take your time. Because <laughs> we got a long ass day to fill. So I had never heard their stories, and Jose gets up first, and he's like, like probably 25 years old. He just texted me. And, um, and you know, he was, uh, you know, in prison and tattooed, a gang member. Um, it, uh, at this phase in his 18 months, he was, uh, had found himself as a very valuable member of our uh, substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery, and now he's helping younger homies and homegirls with their addiction issues. So not only was he in prison, he had a stretch of time as a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. And so he gets up in front of 600 social workers and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasped. And he says, it sounds way worser in Spanish. <laughs> and I don't think I'd ever seen this before. We really got whiplash going from, from laugh to gasp. But then he continued, I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California. And she walks me up to an orphanage. And she knocks on the door. And the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid, and she left me there for 90 days till my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me, and my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine, and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. The first t-shirt because the blood would seep through. Second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool. It's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three T-shirts? And then he stopped speaking so overwhelmed with emotion, and he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three T-shirts. Well into my adult years, because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. 
For an idea has taken root in the world, it's at the root of all that's wrong with it, and the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. We go from this place to stand against that idea. So let me wind this down. You know, it occurs uh, to universities sometimes to force their students to read my books against their will. <laughs> I'm not complaining. But uh, I was invited to spoke to Gonzaga, my alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane, who every year in March Madness ruined my bracket. Uh, and they had forced the incoming freshmen to read Tattoos on the Heart, and they said, would you come and speak, and we're going to have a big venue, a thousand people. And I said, uh, sure. And then they said, you know, can you uh, bring two homies with you? And I do when people are going to pay for it, you know, and, and the logistics aren't too crazy. And so uh, I always pick homies in the same way. I always pick enemies, rivals among our trainees just to force them to share a hotel room just to mess with them. And, <laughs> and I always pick homies who've never flown before just for the thrill of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. It was a number of years ago, I remember I was had two older Vatos and we were at LAX and we were going to fly to D.C., and uh, one of them, dead serious, says, Hey, G, are, are we flying Virgin Airlines because it's our first time? <laughs> I said, Yes, you know, it's a requirement. Uh, <laughs> we'll be coming home on American. <laughs> so I picked two homies, Bobby, an African-American gang member who worked in the bakery, and Mario, who at the time worked in our merchandise store, in our headquarters. And I've done this a thousand times easily with men and women. I've never picked anybody quite like this guy, Mario. I and mean, you're used to homies being nervous. Oh my God, this guy was petrified to the bone. In fact, he was hyperventilating, which I'd never seen a person do that, you know, <gasps> like that, you know, and, and we hadn't even, you know, boarded the plane yet. So, so we're at Burbank airport, big, small airport, big bay windows and Southwest Airlines mainly, big planes, but they don't have that hermetically sealed chute to board the plane. You have to walk out onto the tarmac like you're the president, and you walk up the steps to the, of the front of the plane, and the big feature at Burbank are the steps at the back of the plane. So uh, I'm sitting there with Mario, and Bobby's exploring the uh, airport. Our plane arrives. It's early morning. People are deplaning. And I turned to Mario, I said, you know, that's, that's going to be our plane. And, <gasps> and I think, wow, he may die before we actually climb those stairs. You know, it's starting to freak me out. <coughs> then I see our, our flight crew arrives, the pilot and flight attendants. And there are two female flight attendants, and both of them have very large cups of Starbucks coffee, and they're schlepping up the front stairs to board the plane. And, and Mario says, when are we going to board the plane? I said, you know, as soon as they sober up the pilots. <laughs> there they go now. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. So I should tell you that in our 31-year history as an organization, Mario is the most tattooed individual who's ever worked there, which is, trust me, saying a lot. And he's all sleeved out, you know, to his uh, fingertips, uh, head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids that say the end, so that when he's lying in his coffin, there will be no doubt for anybody, <laughs> apparently. And so I'm trying to calm him down, and I'm walking him through the airport, and, and people are like this. Oh my God. <laughs> Mothers are clutching their kids more closely. I'm thinking, wow, isn't that interesting? Because if you were to go to Homeboy tomorrow 
and walk in and ask anybody who works there quick, who's the kindest, most gentle soul who works here? They won't say me. They'll think for half a second, they'll say Mario. Yeah, Mario. He works in the cafe, you'll see him. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. Mario is proof that the highest form of spiritual maturity is tenderness. So we get to Gonzaga, and of course there's the big talk Tuesday night. What they don't tell you is uh, there are 93 other talks that they have planned, you know, all during the day on Tuesday. You know, this talk, this talk, this lunch, this meeting, this talk, all damn day. And I said, look, to these two guys, I'm going to sit in the back of the classroom. You get up and talk, because I'm going to talk mainly tonight. And, and they did it, and Mario in particular was quite terrified, but they did a good job. Stories of terror and torture and violence and and abuse of every imaginable kind. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance. Otherwise, you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of either of their childhoods. So the nighttime talk comes, and I, you know, I coax the two of them to get up before me and do what they basically did, only briefer in the classrooms, like seven-minute snapshot of their lives. And, and they got up, They were especially Mario was quite terrified because it was a thousand people, but they did a good job. And then I got up and did my thing. And, and then I invite them to stand on either side of me to do a Q&A and, yes, ma'am. And a woman stands and she goes, yeah, I got a question. It's for Mario. First question out the gate. And Mario is a tall, skinny drink of water, and he, he clutches the microphone. He's just terrified. And he says, yes. <laughs> and she says, well, Mario, you say you're a father, and you, you know, have a son and a daughter. They're about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes, and he clutches the microphone even more intently. And he's starting to tremble, and he's getting a friggin' hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he's going to say. And when suddenly he blurts out, I just... As soon as he says those two words, he rushes back to his microphone-clutching, closed-eyed refuge. And now I know he's losing the battle with his tears. But he wants to get the whole sentence out. I, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence until the woman who asked the question stands, and now it's her turn to cry. Why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving. You are kind. You are gentle. You are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand, and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hands, so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers returned him to himself. And let there be no doubt that everybody standing was also returned to themselves, which shouldn't surprise us, because it's mutual. Everybody looking at each other and saying, you're here. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till you appear and the soul feels its worth. Oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And you don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go there so the folks at the margins make us different and pretty soon you cease to care whether anyone accuses you of wasting your time at the margins for in this place of which you say it is a waste 
there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness. The voices of those who sing. Thank you very much.